Good morning, everyone. This is Melinda McClymans, um, and I'm hosting Keys to Understanding the Middle East podcast. We're live now on Facebook um, and also on Periscope, at least for a little while longer. And um, I am really pleased to introduce our guest speaker for today, Dr. Alam Payan, the director of the Middle East Study Center at Ohio State University. Um, Dr. Payan is an expert in geopolitics and Islamic jurisprudence, actually. Um, but he's also a, a native of Afghanistan, which is the country we're going to be talking about today. He got his bachelor's from Kabul University in political science and Islamic studies. Um, and then um, he came on, a, was it a USAID scholarship, Dr. Payan? Yes, yes. In 1969, yeah. Yeah, so a very elite um, scholarship um, that he uh, obtained in 1969 to go to Indiana University here in the U.S. Um, and he went on to get uh, a master's of science in higher education, a master's in political science, and then finally a Ph.D. in political science and higher education. And he is the director of the Middle East Studies Center here at Ohio State. Um, and he, as a native of Afghanistan, he's been able to go back and do field work. Um, he's been to the country uh, over a dozen times since September 11th, 2001. He travels extensively within Afghan borders. During recent trips, he's seen the Taliban's resurgence in Kandahar, Helmand, Zabul, and other provinces in Afghanistan. Um, and he's also, some of you may not know, but he is also a poet and a a reciter of poetry. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to uh, just put it over to you if there's anything else you want to highlight about today's topic or about your background. Uh, well, well, thank you, Melinda. Um, uh, I'm really grateful to you, Melinda. I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, that you have kept our interest, most of us that who do research on Afghanistan and the Middle East, through your podcast and through your conferences and teaching and organizing conferences. And you keep us working hard and, and teaching the students. And you also uh, uh, do this podcast uh, time after time. Uh, and, and, and that's really uh, helpful for people like us and people who are interested in the Middle East, and especially Af Afghanistan is a country which is, is a not, sometimes it's classified as a Middle Eastern country, sometimes it's a Central Asia, but it connects Central Asia to the Middle East and China and also the subcontinent of India. So it's this is what located on the crossroads of trade and migration and civilization. So that, that this is one of the reasons that why Afghanistan has been invaded so many times from, from the Ahmenian Persians to the Alexander the Great uh, to well, let's take the Turks, Chinggis Khan, the Arab armies, uh, three times the British invaded Afghanistan and then the Soviet Union. And then finally, American troops have been in Afghanistan since October the 7th, 2001. Right after September the 11th, American troops went there and American troops are still in Afghanistan. So in another word, when you look at from foreign troops, Afghanistan has been under the invasion of the Soviet Union for 10 years, 1979 to 1989. And then for the past 20 years, Americans are there. And in 2018, President Trump, the ex-president of the United States, ordered that Americans should leave Afghanistan and the troops should be withdrawn after he used the mother of all the bombs on Afghanistan. So he discovered that Afghanistan is not, there is no diplomatic solution for the crisis. And now President Biden is following that and he will complete the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan on September the 11th, uh, 2021. And that would be exactly 20 years after September the 11th terrorist acts which happened in New York, in Washington, D.C. So that's the story of Afghanistan. Now, the big question is asked most of us that who do field research in Afghanistan, that what will be the consequences of the American troops withdrawal? 
Well, in in situations like what happened to Afghanistan, you hardly can can comp- compare one situation with another one, and you say exactly the same thing will happen when the Soviet Union left, the Soviet Red Army left Afghanistan after 10 years of occupation, an unsuccessful occupation. The Soviet Union destroyed Afghanistan and killed about 1.2 million Afghans, and 6 million Afghans became refugees. 4 million of them became internal refugees. But the Soviet Union did not achieve the objective that the Soviet Union came to Afghanistan for in 1979 to 1989. Then Americans went after September the 11th because the main reason for American troops going to Afghanistan was not interested in invading Afghanistan or occupying Afghanistan. The United States went after its enemies, which were the Al-Qaeda, who committed the terrorist act in the Twin Towers in New York, in the Pentagon. So close to 3,000 Americans were killed in that. So Americans went after their enemies to Afghanistan, which were at that time, Al-Qaeda was there, Osama bin Laden was there. And the Taliban government protected that. So that's what America, so Americans had a reason to go there. But the Soviet Union did not have the same kind of reasons as the United States had because of in the wake of the September the 11th. But now after 20 years, Americans have did not find a peaceful solution for Afghanistan. And they're withdrawing without leaving something workable in Afghanistan. So now the main question is, that what will be the major consequences in when the American troops will withdraw from Afghanistan. And now it's probably either you or anyone else that who is listening, ask me about, if you want me, I can list. These are the possibilities. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Please okay. do. Yeah, one is that when a foreign invasion comes to a country, foreign troops comes to a country, that country loses its own sovereignty. It's the invaders that who takes security of that country, economics of that country, military, everything is controlled by the occupying forces, just like the Soviet Union did for for 10 years. And they're the ones that who are making security arrangements and policies and suppressing the enemies that which they call them enemies, even in the people that were fighting for their own country's independence, they're considered enemies by an occupying force. So Americans went there to remove the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They succeeded very quickly. American military did a tremendous job in removing Taliban and Al-Qaeda from power because Americans have warned the Taliban to surrender those Al-Qaeda. But Taliban were not capable of because Osama bin Laden was stronger than Mullah Omar, who was the, 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 the Taliban leader in Afghanistan. So they could not deliver that. So Americans went there and removed both of them from. But there is one thing that Americans did not do, did not succeed. They did not defeat the Taliban and they did not defeat Al-Qaeda. Osama bin Laden was later killed when Obama became the president of the United States in 2011. Osama bin Laden was gone, but still his successors are in Pakistan. That was Al-Qaeda. Then later, other groups were formed in the Middle East after the American occupation of Afghanistan and American occupation of Iraq. Then there was another group which came to being after Al-Qaeda, which was this Daesh or ISIS, Islamic State of Iraq and Levant or ISIL, Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. These are mostly the Sunni which are labeled as the terrorist group, they came to being. And then again, they captured many areas. They captured Iraq uh, from the United... When the United States went to Iraq in 2003, American troops went to Afghanistan in 2001. In 2003, American troops went to Iraq. And from Iraq, they removed Saddam Hussein from the power. But what Americans did in Iraq they removed the Sunni establishment of Iraq, which was controlling Iraq for about 1400 years and established a Shia government there. So after 1400 years, even if the Sunnis were the minority, they're still fighting to capture the same glories as the Sunnis had in Iraq. So that's another. When one country goes and empowers one group, the other groups are not feeling comfortable. When the Soviet Union came to Afghanistan, they would pit Hazaras against Sunnis against the Shiites, Sunnis, Shiites against the Sunnis and Pashtuns against the Farsi speakers, that sort of thing. 
this divide and conquer, it works until some time, then it becomes useless. Now, coming to the consequences, we know that after the Soviet Union left Afghanistan, Afghanistan went to, through a civil war. Uh, one group fighting against another one, one commander against another one, and that was really chaotic. And that was what the people welcomed the Taliban and Afghans somehow. There is a proverb in Persian and in Pashto, both of the Afghan languages, that a drowning person is grabbing the foams, a drumming any kind of stray on the top of the water, that that would save them. So Afghans at that time thought that will look, these commanders who have fought against the Soviet Union probably will save Afghanistan. It was wishful thinking in the part of the Afghans. And they went to a civil war after the Soviet troops left because they did not leave a workable central government in Afghanistan. It was for 10 years, the civil war, and then came September the 11th, and Americans went there. Americans went and they went and somehow established the Hamid Karzai's government, protected the Hamid Karzai's government. Hamid Karzai was, was president for two terms. Then this Ashraf Ghani came. So from 2001 until this moment, the Afghan government is dependent on the American protection, American money. Now when Americans are leaving, so again, there is no central workable government in Afghanistan. The so yeah, what, um, what about a central government in Afghanistan? I mean, how much control could a central government really have over all this mountainous terrain and diverse, you know, um, ethnicities and um, like how much control, like what would that look like? Like, would it be a loose kind of federation or it would be something totally different for the Afghan context? Melinda, you have taught courses with me on Afghanistan. And this is really the, one of the most important questions that you are raising here is that how centralized, powerful government Afghanistan had, what happened? When the foreign invasion happens in a country, which Afghanistan is, it's a history of foreign invasions. Because as I said that it was yeah. on the crossroads of migration, trade, and conquest, too. It was the route of the conquest for the empire builders. Any time that when a foreign invasion comes to a country, and a country is a multi-ethnic, multilingual, sectarian, Shia, Sunni, Pashtun, Persian-speaking, Hazaras, Mongols, all kinds of people, what they happen when a foreign invasion comes, they go to their own corners. They go to their own elders, and so what happened? This is one reason why the central government was always weak, but the provinces were stronger. The chiefs and the khans and the, uh, those guys had power. So Afghanistan, really, this is a very important question that you are raising, did not have a strong centralized government to control the whole Afghanistan. The king in Afghanistan was just like one of the khans or another khans. Shah and Shah. <laughs> yeah, in the case of the Shahin Shah was king of other kings. But yeah. the king of Afghanistan was this why they called it Zahir Khan and Abdurrahman Khan. And this means that he was one of the Khans of other Khans. And those low Khans were ruling their own areas, whether it's Uzbek Khan would rule Uzbek area, it would, they would call them Bai or whatever. And a Pashtun would, the whole border between Afghanistan and Pakistan is about 1400 miles border. These are all protected by the Khans of those region, not the central government. So in, 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 in another word, Afghanistan really never organized a central, there were two or three times in the history of Afghanistan. One was this Ahmad Shah Durrani in 1747, he organized Afghanistan in the central government. Then when he died, his grandchildren fought with each other from different multiple wives, siblings fight, again shattered. Then there was a time, another time, another person came by the name of Amir Abdurrahman Khan in the 19th century. He organized a central government. Then after his death again, his children fought against each other. Then the British invaded three times Afghanistan. Each time these foreign countries invade, they go back, people go back to their, then someone one comes in. So Afghanistan never established a state, nation state, as many other European and other countries established. That I am first, a German, then I am within a German, I am of a different, just, just like Americans are, the, the Polish Americans. What, what about, um, 
So it, it never established a nation state, but they didn't, I mean, Zahir, Sh um, what was his name? Zahir Shah. Yeah, Zahir he, Shah. Was, he was the longest running king in Afghanistan. Uh, his father was killed, uh, Nadir Khan, in 1936. So from okay. 19, 1930, 1934, 1935, he was king until he was deposed by his cousin, uh, Dawood Khan. He did a coup. So what happened? My mother okay. would tell us, our elders, that you guys are the best generation. Look, for 40 years, we have one king. We always had about 10 years, 15 years, one king, and then he will be deposed or killed and assassinated. So you guys are really lucky. You have wow. 40 years of one king, which was this Zahir Khan. And that's why in his time, schools were built, roads were built. Afghanistan was a member of the United Nations, the first founding member of the United Nations in 1945 when that was formed. Afghanistan was one of the original members. So we had some time, and this was the golden age of Afghanistan, This yeah. the, decade, the decades of the 40s, 50s, 60s. And then all of a sudden, then coup happened in the Soviet. So Afghanistan was just becoming a nation state that people will call them Afghans first, and then Pashtun and Tajik and Uzbek later, mm -hmm. just the beginning. And then again, the Soviet Union came invaded, and again, people went to their own corners. When after the American invasion came again, it's Uzbek, after Uzbek commander, Tajik after Tajik, Pashtun after Pashtun, Baloch after Baloch, that's what Uzbek after Uzbek. Here is now we see this General Dostam and General Gulaga, this and all these ethnic people. Now, this is one of the problems that it's very difficult for the United Nations or any other country to really make Afghanistan a cohesive, centrally organized country, which is recognized by the international community and also recognized by all these different ethnic groups which have gone to their own pockets and corners in the past, I would say from 1979, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, Afghanistan does not have an independent government. It was either Babrak Karmal, which the Soviet Union brought them with, to Afghanistan for 10 years. When they left, Americans came. Americans put their own Hamid Karzai on throne in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. And now Ashraf Ghani. So what yeah. happened? When you look at it from an Afghan perspective. Yeah. With Babrak Karmal was a stooge of the Soviet Union. Hamid Karzai and this... Uh, Ashraf Ghani, they are the stooges of the United States. So they do not have the legitimacy in the eyes of many other Legitimacy, yeah. Wow. Well, you are brought by foreign so forces. You came with the foreign troops. You don't have legitimacy. You don't have the... There is a word in Arabic which is called baya. It is the oath of allegiance. And consensus. Yes. You are not... Hamid Kar Babrak Karmal, you are not the leader of Afghanistan. Soviet Union brought you and supported you for 10 years, are his communist groups. Mm -hmm. And Americans have brought Hamid Karzai, supported him. And now Americans are supporting this Ashraf Ghani. So definitely when American supports will go, Ashraf Ghani's, even American generals that who are in Afghanistan, they're predicting that the Afghan government cannot survive. Some people are expecting that they would survive six months. Some say that maybe a year or two. Taliban are now capturing, they're having in control of the Afghanistan and Pakistan borders. They've in control of the Islam Qala, which is between Iran and Afghanistan, one of the entry in between Turkmenistan and Afghanistan, which is called Turgundi. There is another place by the name of Bultak, which is between Afghanistan and Pakistan in the Balochistan area. And also in the Northwest frontier, uh, Jalalabad and others, so that uh, all, all these areas are gradually, uh, Taliban are taking over those. And what are they doing in terms of propaganda for their government? Like, are they still, are they trying to form a Taliban government like they did in the 90s? Yes, Taliban are saying that we are bringing justice. I mean, that's promises. Some people say it's empty promises. Well, look, Afghanistan is not an independent country now. Americans are calling the shots and Americans are supporting. So it's not independent. We will become independent. They use the term, the Farsi word, Khud Mukhtar. Khud Mukhtar means that now we are independent. So we are not independent now. Second, Hamid Karzai and this Ashraf Ghani, they did not establish justice. 
corruption is going on. People are take commanders are yeah. harassing people and taking their properties and looting. So that's what the local commanders uh, and they have not reduced the corruption in Afghanistan. Americans and Russians have failed to reduce the cultivation of the poppies, the drug smuggling, the weapon smuggling. It goes on, and the local commanders are really looting people. So the Taliban are promising we are going to clean all this. We will stop the poppy cultivation, which they did. They succeeded, <coughs> but. The Taliban do not have the cadres, they do not have engineers, they do not have scientists, they do not have doctors. Most of them have left during the Taliban rule and then the women were, the schools were closed. That's what, when we come to the consequences now, people are afraid. First of all, in Afghanistan, women are very much concerned. That they yeah, were allowed to to Just, yeah. first, just like during the Taliban, they were whipped and they were having to head to toe covered. They were not allowed to go to schools. They were not allowed to go to the universities. Education was closed. They were, most of the schools were turned into mud. If Taliban will do the same thing, the women are in the first group that they're, they're very scared now. Many hundreds and thousands of them are leaving Afghanistan right now that you and I are speaking. They're going either to Pakistan or Iran, which are the neighbor. Even some of them go to the former Soviet Union republics because Afghanistan shares boundary with Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. And they're, they're just running. They're leaving. Most of those that work for the government, they are afraid. Let me tell you that right now, Americans that we're talking about this in the United States, there were 80,000 Afghans working with Americans because Americans have been in Afghanistan for the past 20 years. And there were about 18, 19,000 translators working for Americans. The rest of them for the NATO forces. There were drivers, there were chauffeurs, there were cooks who worked. So there were almost 80,000 people who are asking for visas to come to the United States because they worked for the American, their contractors. Mm -hmm. And that's really the pressure is from the military now because the military commanders are saying that, well, these guys have fought with us against Taliban for the past 20 years. Their lives are in danger. They will slaughter them. But we do not know. They may or they may not slaughter them. Taliban are saying that, well, no, your life is not in danger. We will, we will not hurt you. But they will not be in control of everything. A local commander will take a decision. Oh, look, this guy was working for Americans. He's a collaborator. Yeah. Let's, let's get rid of him. And that's happened. But yeah. there is a chaos after, after the establishment shatters, after the government collapses, all kinds of things are unleashed. So that's what Afghans are afraid of, that there will be another period of... Women collaborators, what, I mean, how are they viewed? Are they just seen as collaborators or are they seen as, um, I don't know, like disloyal? What, what's their treatment? What happens? The people that were fighting against Hamid Karzai's government and Ashraf Ghani's government, and they have, they have been translators with American troops going to the villages and investigating and things. They were, they, they're all looked by the Taliban as collaborators. It just like happened after the Nazi Germany. When the Nazi Germany went to Poland and Czechoslovakia and other places, uh, then some of the people that who supported them, they became collaborators. And when people got their hands on them, many of them were slaughtered. Yeah. Um, this, this happened. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are looked at as somehow, I mean, the, the whole Ar Armenian genocide that we are talking about, uh, it was in World War One, and uh, somehow the Turks considered them to be collaborators with the Russians or with the Allied forces uh, against the Ottoman Turkey in World War One. So they were regarded as uh, collaborators. And in Egypt and other places, the Copts, the two were working for the British when British were in control of the Egypt. They were viewed by other ordinary people as collaborators. And in India, for example, there were many that who worked in the British government as a police, as this and that. And then when they got independence, many of the hot-headed who became Pakistanis and Indians, they were considered as, well, you were a collaborator, you were a spy of the British, you were this and that. So unfortunately, that's the, that's the fate of the, of the people who have worked for the occupying forces. Some of them have been killed, some of them have been harassed it will continue there is there is no doubt in my mind 
I read this morning that there were a thousand five hundred on the border of Turkey now, Afghans. Yes, uh, waiting to get in. Just just arrived, and obviously these are desperate people who've been devastated by something. Because I mean, to suddenly have that number of people arrive and go that distance all the way across Iran to Turkey, I think we can assume that they are being decimated. Yes, in the in the past. I would say probably 20 years. Uh, there are Afghans, when you see that, the, many of them have even reached Germany. They passed from Turkey to Greece. That's the, the Marmara Sea, they, the Aegean Sea and others, they, they, they go uh, 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 the, up to Cyprus and other places. Uh, just like what happened in, in, in hundreds and thousands of people, they just uh, very leaky boats. They want to leave Africa and go to uh, to Europe, so Afghans are one of the, the the communities that you can find that you can find Afghans in on on, on the borders of right now. The, the news that I have, hundreds and thousands of Afghans are leaving Afghanistan, going to Pakistan through two corridors. When what one one is called Torham, which is in northwest frontier, another one is at the Balochistan area, which is they call it Boldak. And hundreds and thousands of Americans are now knocking on the doors of the Iranians to go to Iran. And some of them want to go to Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, which are the bordering former Soviet states. Now they are independent countries of Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. So Afghanistan has six neighbors. The only country that they are not going to is China. Because in China, there's the story of the Uyghurs. So China is Afghanistan's neighbor too. So that, that boundary is secure, but all other boundaries are now crossed by the Afghans. I just realized I need power. Excuse me. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just, it's not plugged in and I just noticed my battery's low. Here we go. Okay, back in business. We won't get cut off because my battery ran out. <laughs> yeah, and um, and then for those that remain, um, you know, as we've already discussed this morning, there's great diversity in Afghanistan, you know, between ethnicities, but also religious affiliation. Um, wh what is going on uh, with like ethnic clashes or, and especially like in terms of the smaller groups like Hazaras that are like a small minority, um, how are they faring now? Do you, do you have any news on that? Like, Yes, I do. Uh, it's, it's a good question, Melinda. Um, as I mentioned that women as a group, whether it's an Uzbek woman or Pashtun woman or Tajik woman who wants education, people want education for their girls, for their daughters, for their sisters. <coughs> That's one group. So all women of any ethnicity is the first group that which they're very vocal about their rights. They said, well, look, whatever we have achieved in the past 20 years, relatively, at least we can go to schools and work in the offices and we will not be allowed to do that. The second group is, as you mentioned, Hazaras. Afghanistan is a Sunni majority. It's, a, it's about 99% of the Afghans are Muslims, 99 there are Hindus and Sikhs and some Christians here and there, and there are some Zoroastrians, very small group, little, but these are the religious minorities. They're about almost less than 1%. The rest of them, 99 point, almost two or 3%, they're Muslims. These Muslims, if you can divide them into Shia, Sunni, 15% of the Afghans are estimated. These are all estimates. 15% are Shia, and about 85% of the Afghans are the Sunni Muslims. And of the Sunni Muslims, most, almost all of them, overwhelmingly, the Sunni Muslims are of the Hanafi school of Sunni. There are four Sunni schools. So Hanafi, and so are Turks, they are Hanafis too. In many other Arab countries, there are other schools of Sunni. Hazaras are, they're, for them, it's a double jeopardy. Hazaras are Shiites. They come in the 15% of the Shiites. And at the same time, Hazaras are Mongols. 
they look like Mongols, they look like Uzbeks, they look like mostly Asiatic people. Their features are different than the Indo-Iranian people, like the Pashtuns are like the Baluch. So that's what. On the one hand, they look like more like the like Japanese, Chinese, Japanese, and Uzbeks and that. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, they're a, a, a religious a, a Shia. Uh, so from both sides, they were, they, they were persecuted in the past. It will continue to be persecuted. That's one group that are in danger. So the, the, the sectarian groups are also in danger, and the ethnic now. Then there is a Farsi-speaking Tajiks and the Pashto-speaking Pashtuns. Even though Farsi and Pashto are both Indo-Iranian languages, but they are different branches of the Indo-Iranian languages belonging to the Indo-European family. So this also the, the Pashto-Farsi division, Pashto speakers, Farsi. You mentioned a very good point. Afghanistan is a very mountainous country. The tallest mountains after Mount Everest. Many of them are in Afghanistan. And these tall mountains on the one side of the mountain, you have Hazaras. On the other side of the mountain, you have Pashtun. They speak one language, they speak another. Even their dresses are different. So this multi-ethnic in very pockets of these mountain valleys, very dangerous to, I mean, difficult to reach. Yeah. And that has been, historians are telling us that one of the difficulties that the invaders are facing in Afghanistan is it's terrain. It is topography. It's very difficult to go to these small valleys after this village and that village. People can go and fight for, literally for, in the past. Now we have helicopters and guns and bombardment, but they would go and live in that valley for, for centuries. People will not even go in. Central government could not control that. So the central government never had control over those hard, hard to reach areas. So they will continue to be ruled by their own chiefs, by their own tribal leaders are their spiritual leaders. So these are all the factors in Afghanistan that a central government used to work with the local chiefs of the area and somehow either buy their loyalty or either give them privileges, so that sort of thing. And this is one reason corruption becomes one of the instruments by the central government to somehow bribe these people in these khans to bring them to the fold so it so and then what happened when the foreign invaders come they take advantage of this divisiveness yeah and they're supporting Hazaras against they're already frustrated group and when the soviet union came they recruited Hazaras and farsi speakers and this and that more than the other group because they had the grudge against the majority of the, the pluralistic majority of the pashtuns you go after resentful minorities if you're a foreign invader. Wow, that's so cynical, Alam. <laughs> yes, if you're a foreign invader, yeah. you go after those frustrated minorities. If you're a Christian, the United Kingdom, and you go to Egypt, mm-hmm. you find Copts and others who are already Christians, and you recruit them in the police, and you make them spies. And the, I mean, unfortunately, that has been, this is what when they say con- divide and conquer, the conquerors have done that. What they have, they have accentuated already existing bad situation into worse by pitting one group against another one to take control. Uh, and that, that was exactly the British did in India. Muslims against the Hindus, Hindus against the Sikhs, this and that, uh, supporting Gorkhas and are supporting Pashtuns in one area, Baluchs in another area, Punjabis in another area. To, 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 do, you to, think, do you think Shiites? Uh, or Shia, or she, however you want to pronounce it. There's different ways. Uh, I say she. Do you think she are under threat in Afghanistan because of that? Yes. If Taliban will come, not only Taliban, if Taliban will keep their affiliation and closeness with Al-Qaeda and Daesh, this Al-Qaeda and Daesh, they are very much, they consider Shiites as heretics. So this is another problem. Melinda, that's another good question here. There is a possibility in Afghanistan that the Shia-Sunni conflict will heat up and that cannot stay in Afghanistan. It can cross the boundaries because Iran, oh is, a, Shia, Iran is a Shia majority country. Sunnis are the minority. Then in Pakistan, we have a very large number of the Shias. So this Sunni-Shia things, if it can really, someone can 
fend the fire there. Ron is right next door. <clears throat> there she is there. Potentially the Shia Sunni divide is there. And then this is what Al Qaeda and Daesh and Islamic Jihad, which are mostly Sunni, there is only one armed, which is labeled terrorist group, which is Hezbollah. That is a Shia group. Mm -hmm. It is active in Syria. <clears throat> Hezbollah is very active in Lebanon. Hezbollah is very active in Syria. Hezbollah is very active in Iraq with the Shiite. So this one reason, this, this is now, this is a good question now that why in Yemen, for example, there is Iran is supporting the Shiites. There is a different branch of Shia. They call it the Yedi Shiites. It's a Shia group in Yemen, therefore the 40% of the Yemen. And the Saudi Arabians and United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Egypt, they are the Sunni majority countries. They're on the one side with the Sunni in Yemen and there is in Yemen, the proxy war is going on between Shia and Sunni. So there is a potential of similar things. And I hope it does not happen. I mean, that's only hope. Uh, but the potential is there that one outside group, Iran, will support the Shiites in Afghanistan and Pakistan will support the Sunnis in Afghanistan. And Uzbek and Turkuman are Sunnis too. They will support. So there is a possibility. And then again, Tajikistan has a really nice minority group of the Ismaili Shiites. There's another branch. And so does Afghanistan. So there, there is a, the potential of the Shia Sunni uh, sort of eruption is there in the minorities versus the majority. The plural, well, Afghanistan does not have a absolute majority of Pashtuns. It's there about 40, 45%. So no one in Afghanistan, no ethnic group has a 51% majority in Afghanistan. Yeah. So that, that has been also one of the problems of Afghanistan that none of the groups are dominant. The same is true like in Pakistan, for example. Punjabis are having a pluralistic majority, but they do not have the absolute majority in Pakistan. And this is one reason why Pashtuns are going in one direction in Pakistan, Balochs are going in a different direction, Punjabis and Sindhis and that sort of thing. That's a really important point, Dr. Payan. Like, so, yeah, so while Pashtuns are the majority, they're not, they're not an absolute majority, they're a yeah. pluralistic majority. And so when you look at the um, decentralized kind of system Afghanistan has had over the years, that's also why, like they're, um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about that? Like Afghan, uh, like the name Afghanistan that correlates more maybe to the Pashtun identity and ethnicity? Somehow, yeah, somehow but, the yeah. word Afghan, yeah. yeah. Uh, the word Afghan, when you talk to a Tajik or a Farsi speaker, Qizil Bash in Afghanistan and Shia, they call these Pashto speakers as Afghan. They are using Afghan, which is Afghan. It was, and this is one reason why it is resented by the Tajiks and by others, that why do you call this Afghanistan? Af Afghan is Pashtun. But that's not. Somehow now the Afghan term has been so popularized in Afghanistan that it's used for anyone that was Afghanistan citizen. Yeah. And then again, when we were children, the, the books, anyone that was from Afghanistan, Afghan, a citizen of Afghanistan is an Afghan, no matter if he's Uzbek, Turkmen, Tajik. So that sort of somehow to make Afghanistan as a cohesive nation state, that was from my childhood that I went to school, we were taught that Hazara is Afghan, Uzbek is Afghan, Turkmen. But when you go to back to the traditional ways of thinking, the, the word Afghan was used. So that's one reason why some Tajiks and some Farsi speaker people said that, well, look, we should not use Afghanistan as a term. Let's use the Khurasan. Khurasan is a neutral term, which they used to use for Afghanistan and Eastern Iran. This was all part of the Khurasan. So this is also very debated by the Farsi speakers and the Pashto speakers. This is a very good question that Afghanistan, since it's a, uh, Pashtuns do not have the, the 50 plus 1 percent majority. Mm -hmm. So there always we had a very compromised kind of government that the president will be, uh, the king will always have ministers who are the Shiites and Hazaras. Hazaras were always part of the government because to to bring them to the fold. The Afghan okay. king, yeah. So that's one reason why even in today's the, 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 the constitution of Afghanistan, 
is that the, the president of Afghanistan, it has become a tradition now. Hamid Karzai was a Pashtun. One of his uh, vice president was Hazara. Okay. One of his vice president was a Tajik. When Ashraf Ghani came, the same thing. He's a Pashtun. One of his vice president was an Uzbek, this general Dostum, and another one. At that, that uh, I mean, it has become a tradition that, that you Pashtuns are not the majority. Don't form the cabinet all of Pashtuns. They would be resented by the Tajiks, by the Uzbeks, by the Turkumans, by the Kizilbash. And uh, Kizilbash are the, the, the they are Indo European people, in Indo Iranian, but they are Shiites too, like the Iranian. So, so Afghanistan has this ethnic groups, which mostly in the time of the wars, in the time of the conflict, crisis, they go to their own, and that's what, uh, for their own protection, they mm -hmm. go to, after the local commanders to protect them, and those are the armed people, and they become very powerful. And they have their own traditions too. I mean, especially, you know, in the case of the rural areas and the mountains, I mean, you can't really expect somebody on the other side of the mountain to have, you know, the group on the other side of the mountain to have the same exact rules and laws and understandings of how things are done because there's going to be a big cultural difference. There's traditions and of leadership and government. I mean, basically. Yeah. That, as I mentioned that, so in my lifetime, uh, when I was first grade and second grade, most of the books that given to us at that time were emphasizing this, that the, the, the Shia, Sunni, Tajik, Uzbek, this and that. But in reality, this existed and it exists until this date. As Shia is a Shia and Sunni is a Shia. Intermarriage is taking place, but it's not as common as right. someone would think. That's a good Shia sign. Shia, is Shia Sunni marriage Sunni. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let let me say, tell you my story. I am yes. a Sunni, Hanafi Sunni Muslim. My wife is a Kizilbash, she is a Shia. Uh, my mother was a Tajik. My father was a Pashtun. Yes. So there were hundreds like me. So this thing was a little bit weakening when we were growing up. But then Probably came because, to, because of the um, education the level. level. Yeah the nation state building and unification. And again, going to the same universities, looking in the, working in the same offices, if you were a Tajik or Uzbek or Turkoman. So it was getting less and less when we were growing up. Then unfortunately, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan came as a big, and I always mention as a, as a political historian, that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was the most dreadful things which happened to Afghans. From that point that Soviet Union invaded, Afghanistan has not seen any good day. That has, this is the worst invasion of the history. I mean, the, the, first of all, the brutality of that. When you look at 1.2 million Afghans killed, 1 million wounded, Six million Afghans became refugees in Iran and Pakistan, and they went to Australia. The United States even brought about almost 300,000 Americans as refugees. They're in Australia, they're in Europe, they're in Germany. It was the most devastating. And all what happened? The That's Soviet over half the population of that time. Yes, it's half. If you count the six million external refugees, four million internally displaced, 1.2 million killed, one, one million air drums broken and the, the casualties of the war, uh, wounded soldiers or wounded Mujahideen are under the bombardment. It's a really one out of two Afghan was either killed or wounded or became, it's the highest statistics until this date. Uh, and fixing that society is beyond the power of the United States. It has to be an international effort. And unfortunately that has not happened. A piecemeal help have been done in Afghanistan, but. The United Nations has done almost very little. Uh, the Conference of Islamic States have done very little. I mean, all these Arab money and others and others, they, they've done almost very little to, to, to improve the, 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 the lives of people, such as people in Afghanistan, which have been. And again, they became the victims of the Cold War between the superpowers. They're the frontline country. 
and it, it it is it is ignored by not only distant countries, uh, but it is has been ignored by the neighbors. Six neighbors of Afghanistan, each one of them have their own interest. Iran is interested in the 15% Shiites. Pakistan is interested in the sort of Pashtuns and others that which they can use it for their own strategic depth. Uh, so it's, uh, China is the only country which is neighboring Afghanistan. China has boundaries with Afghanistan about 15, 16 miles. They're not active in Afghanistan. They, 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 the Chinese have done a good policy. In all these fighting and invade, they did not interfere in Afghanistan's internal affairs. Almost all other neighbors did, directly or indirectly. So, yeah, so does that, China have any presence in Afghanistan at all, like business-wise or otherwise? Who? Uh, you mean, China? No, China, China has. China, China is very aggressive. China is now very aggressive in Africa because there are tremendous minerals and resources. China is the only country which, Afghanistan is a country which has lithium, which just discovered about a few years ago. One of the richest lithium mines are in Afghanistan, iron ore, copper. What happened? Chinese contracted the copper. Copper is in Afghanistan now extracted by the Chinese. So Chinese are looking at the minerals and, and I'm, I'm certain Afghanistan has very rich, precious minerals from lapis lazuli to emerald to rubies and things like that and lithium. And Chinese are more aggressive in establishing economic relationships and buying rights to the mines and things like that. They have not interfered in supporting one group against another one. And Chinese have a very good reputation in Afghanistan. That's one thing. If you talk to an Afghan and tell you that, well, which one of the neighbors were probably the best neighbors of Afghanistan in these difficult times, they will point to China. That they did not side with one group or another group. They did not brought soldiers. They did not support. They did not. Uh, so that's. But all others, in one way or the other, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan were part of the Soviet Union until the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. So there were, there were Uzbek, Turkmen, Tajik soldiers fighting in Afghanistan against the Afghans during the Soviet invasion. Pakistan has interfered bringing Taliban and supporting the Mujahideen. Iran has supported one group against another group. The only country which did not interfere is China. And this is one reason Afghans would love Chinese to extract the minerals or things. And first of all, they are cheap. They're doing it cheaper than the other countries do when they bargain. I mean, what's that? When they're bidding. Uh, and then the second one is that they did not show their political uh, interest much in Afghanistan, the China. So Chinese are popular in Afghanistan as far as a good neighbor is concerned. Okay. Well, so, and that leads me to my last question. What are the solutions? What should we be asking for, like to um, help with this horrible situation where people are fleeing and, you know, Taliban are targeting people? And... Uh, when you listen to President Biden, uh, he tells you that we are not leaving Afghanistan altogether. We will still help the government. We will still not by soldiers to be in combat, American troops, men and women to go and fight and die, just like they did in the past. So there will be no combat. But we are not forfeiting our rights to really defend our interests or our friends' interests. And Americans will continue to help Afghanistan in its an economic sphere, education, health, and others and others, from sending vaccine to whatever. Uh, so that is what is coming from White House today. But many of the, when you listen to the people that who have studied Afghanistan and done field research, uh, they are mentioning that there's one thing which has not happened. It, it is important. That the United Nations was not given a support by the members of the United Nations 
to either introduce peacekeeping forces in Afghanistan. This has never happened. The blue helmets have done to between Israel and Palestinians and between Israel and Egypt. So the United Nations peacekeeping forces have never been introduced to Afghanistan. That's one thing. Never tried. I didn't know that. So NATO forces have been there though, right? NATO? No. 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 Oh, okay. No. So just the blue helmets have never gone to Afghanistan. Yeah, the United Nations played to organize the conferences and diplomatic, that sort of thing. That's one thing. The second group. So I'm, I'm saying like, okay, so blue helmets haven't gone, but NATO troops, were NATO troops there? The like NATO troops were there, yes. Yeah. NATO, NATO is a military alliance. The NATO troops were in Afghanistan because the, when, when Americans had 100,000 troops in Afghanistan, 100,000 during the Obama administration, 100,000 American troops, 50,000 NATO troops went with Americans as allies of the United States because they are members of the NATO. There yeah. are 150,000 American troops, about 200,000 Afghan troops. They did not suppress the Taliban. It's amazing when you look at that. 100,000 American troops, very well organized, mechanized, and 50,000 NATO troops. We're talking about 150,000 foreign troops. So what does it mean that Afghanistan does not have a military solution? If it had this 150,000 well-armed Australian, British, right. New Zealand, American, this and that, the NATO forces, they did not succeed, including Turkey. Turkey is a member of the NATO. Mm -hmm. How can now this Afghan government of Ashraf Ghani can survive the Taliban? when 150,000 foreign troops with Afghan troops did not suppress the Taliban. So that's one conclusion that Afghans are drawing. The second one is that I mentioned that the United Nations was never allowed by the Soviet Union when they occupied Afghanistan. The United Nations was never allowed by Americans to take a very important role in Afghanistan. And there is another organization which can do something in Afghanistan which they never did. Organization of the Islamic Conference. Mm. There are about 47 members of the Muslim government. Organization of the Islamic, from Saudi Arabia to Egypt to Indonesia to Tajikistan, they're all members of this. They have not been given a role to play a sort of peacemaking in Afghanistan and to develop a mechanism for that. I'm, I'm thinking about this, that these two organizations have just taken the back seat uh, in solving Afghanistan's problems diplomatically or that sort of thing. Right. So if these two groups will become active and some funding will continue, medicine and school and books and pencils and whatever is needed. Um, in Afghanistan, the population has estimated between 30 million people right now, it could be less or more because of, these are all statistics. And Afghanistan could stand on its own feet. It used to be self-sufficient before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in terms of food and others and others. And it can become again. <clears throat> there is one thing in Afghanistan which is good. It's most of the older people have died, either in the war <laughs> or malnutrition and things like that, which is, is when you look at that, it's a younger yeah. population. Uh, it's, it's a younger group. If you channel their energies into road building and agricultural farms and things like that, which would be- Yeah, that's the key, channel those youthful energies. Yeah. Yeah, and instead, instead of cultivating poppies, I mean, yeah. some people think that, well, it's a poppy cultivation is a result of the Soviet invasion and wars and fighting and things like that. Never in my lifetime I had that many poppy fields in Afghanistan. When I'm going right now to Afghanistan sometimes, so the whole area where, where you can irrigate is poppy fields because there is no central government controlling it. There is no police. It's not a priority. And it's a so, good cash crop. Yes, it's cash crop. It may, if you have one acre of land irrigab irrigable and you plant poppies and 10 acres of wheat and barley, this one acre which leads less labor, less, give you more yield for the family. Someone will be insane to go and plant wheat. That's what they do. So if 
Some people think it, there is no way for that. We cannot fight against cocaine and we declared war. But there are success stories. Turkey was also like Afghanistan at one point. There are cities in Turkey which are named Afyun. I do not know if you have heard that. I mean, no. Yeah, Afyun is one of... So Turkey was one of the Does centers. Afyun mean poppy? Yeah, Afyun means okay. poppy. <laughs> okay. so this, Turkey was one of the exporter of poppies and people were addicted. Finally, what happened? Turkey became a member of NATO in 1951. And it was the NATO forces in the United Nations. Turkey prevented that and succeeded in eradicating the poppy cultivation and the opium trade. In so Turkey was rich. Turkey is a very fertile area. <coughs> so Afghanistan, it, it's the lack of policing. It's less lack of introduction, interdiction, and police and judges and others. They're all corrupt because there's so much money. In, yeah. in, in, in drug smuggling. And Afghanistan has become the largest producer of raw opium right now that you and I are speaking. Some people wow. say it's over 90% of the world raw opium is converted. Now, not only raw opium. The raw opium is converted into heroin and it's done all inside Afghanistan. There are small cottage oh. industries here. Yeah. And they're exporting it to Europe and to the United States, Columbus, Ohio. So the, 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 the Afghan heroin is coming to everywhere. To my neighborhood, your neighborhood. So Afghanistan is the largest producer of of, of this now drugs. Uh, that's that's another thing that it needs. And Americans have not done anything about eradicating the opium. And the, it continues, and the warlords are taking advantage of that. The Taliban are taking advantage of that because there is tons of money, and Taliban say, okay, go and plant. So the economic angle is yet another really um, important issue and topic to discuss. Um, I think I think we should dedicate our next podcast to it, or at least one of our near future ones. I we wish can that you and I can bring sometimes by Zoom um, our friend. Oh, Dawood Azami? Dawood Azami. He has done a very he good study really on, on that situation, and probably we can have a podcast, whatever, with him. Let's do that. Yeah, that's a great and idea. Then, so that, that that would be a good topic. That uh, yeah, causes, the causes of the poppy cultivation and the poppy culture, the drug culture in Afghanistan. It's, a, it's an economic need. Let's take if I'm if I have a, Afghan families are extended families. If I'm a farmer, and I have six children. <laughs> seven children, which is very common in Afghanistan. And my sister lives with me. My mother, grandmother lives with me, that sort of thing. And I have only about 10, 11 acres of land. And should I go and plant puppies? Uh, and if, if I can get away with that, that's just human nature uh, because that's a cash crop. If the drug smugglers give you the money in advance. Okay, go and plant. I am, I'm the buyer. I will buy your all your apium, uh, raw apium. The paste. They, uh, yeah, to, they give an offer that it's hard to refuse. And on top of that, the, the, the drug cartels are involved. They sometimes intimidate people that if you do not I'm killing you. So that's a, the, the, yeah. there's all sorts of uh, this, this, this drug cartels are intimidating, killing. So, so it, it goes in hand. Terrorism, poppy cultivation, uh, they all go hand in hand. This chain has to be broken somewhere. And it could be done. It's not that it's, it's, it, it has not been done. Turkey is a very good example that how they did it. Uh, one can modify the policies, but it could be done everywhere else. Very good. Well, it's time to wrap up. We've been on for an hour now, but before we go, I want to make sure to share with our audience um, the courses you teach, um, whatever projects you're working on, and any other resources you want to share. Um, Some of these things that I'm sharing in my both courses, one is that uh, the survey course that I'm teaching, it's an uh, introduction to the modern Middle East. That would be a section that when I come to Afghanistan and the, the region. But many of these issues in my upper division course, which is graduate students can take it. It's contemporary issues in the Middle East. So I, I, I discuss these in my classes with students. Excellent. And um, what what have you been busy with lately? Well, I'm working on an article now, uh, which would be uh, 
this the consequences of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan led to the Afghanistan become after they left Afghanistan a vacuum was created this the question of vacuum when the Soviet troops left vacuum was created by the Soviet troop withdrawal and that vacuum was finally filled by these international terrorist groups including al qaeda al qaeda was one of those there were other terrorist groups inside of Afghanistan so that's what what will happen if americans will totally become disinterested in afghanistan uh, not as a military power but as a country that which is at the head of the free world and the, the situation in afghanistan if, if it could deteriorate there it that's what one of the poets iqbal uh, which was the, from the subcontinent of india he has a very good poem about afghanistan and he said that asia is a continent and afghanistan is the heart of that continent he mentioned the heart of continent not because of its importance of economics or education or whatever he said that well, because afghanistan is in mostly sharing boundaries with central asia east asia the middle east and the subcontinent of india whatever happens in afghanistan it does not stay in afghanistan it's it radiates to other so this it's a beautiful in farsi he has written that it's it's the heart asia is a continent afghanistan is the heart what happened to the heart it does not stay in the heart because heart is the the, the body it radiates if a heart is weak other parts of the body becomes weak so that, that the, the, he mentions that so iqbal was uh, not only a poet uh, he had a phd from heidelberg university and he has written on the german philosophy and i think uh, uh, one of his topic was nietzsche so he was very well versed in 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 at that time that how hundreds and thousands of years which have passed in Af- how how from afghanistan all these invaders came and went in not only the invaders religions cultures agricultural techniques uh, silk the silk industry developed in china i mean when julius caesar was not born chinese were making silk textile uh, that yeah used to be yeah uh, those techniques were passed and even uh, we went to bursa remember turkey i did there's the silk market that they had that was one of the silk markets that the chinese until this date then they developed their own silk worm production in afghanistan we have places that which they adopted from the chinese so okay. cultural techniques yeah this kanat this underground channels that the chinese built and afghans have learned from that central asia and that which underground water using bringing it to the surface so these were uh, techniques of agriculture crop rotation some of these things from one country to another one uh, so th- there were a lot of things which happened uh in those areas uh, so and chinese are working now to revive the silk road again yeah. that i felt yeah. what road <laughs> <laughs> i yeah. don't know whether they will succeed or not yeah Past i was kind of thinking about road. that when i asked about chinese business interests in afghanistan it sounds like with the minerals that that they can find there that that will be a really important part of it Yeah I I'm certain that if Afghanistan will have a peace the estimates are by the experts that this lithium in the this Ghazni Ghazni is about 30 miles from east of Kabul west of Kabul southwest of Kabul capital of Afghanistan this is almost as good as an oil in a country whether the united arab emirates really? yes uh because lithium is one of the, the 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 elements that which are used for this lithium batteries in, in your cell phone and my cell phone and many other things so it's one of the highly desired uh, that could and then again uh, Afghanistan has there is a diamond substitute uh which is they call it black diamond in Afghanistan which is also using for boring and drilling and things like that it's very one of the tough elements could be uh that has in jalalabad in those areas they have the mines in the world's largest lapis lazuli and rubies and emerald mines in afghanistan mostly in the panjshir area you know so so afghanistan is minerally rich 
that there is a big, huge iron ore uh, in, in, in the western part of Afghanistan. So Afghanistan has copper and ore. Uh, I do not know. Maybe you are. Surveys have not been done. Geological surveys, because it's in the past, from 1970, it's in war. Mm. Geological surveys have not been done in Afghanistan. In the war, you do not do the geological surveys. Right. So, so there is a possibility. Especially that, with all the landmines. Yeah. And the unexploded ordnance that are in Afghanistan from. The largest in the world. Yeah. The, the Soviet Union in the 10 years, they have planted so many mines and they did not clear it. They did not give the maps. To it. Still, when I'm in Afghanistan, I go there. It, sometimes I go to the this provincial cities, to the hospitals. And then a, a, a girl or a boy stepped on one of those anti-personal mines with a hand blown up, bringing to the... This is a common... I mean, Europe, in Europe, there's many unexploded ordinances until they, they, they find it here and there in Germany and many other places. So Afghanistan was one of the, 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 the mined, the most mined country. Afghanistan and Cambodia uh, are one of those countries that... So that's another thing, mine cleaning. Another, yeah, another big topic. Yeah. All right. Well, I think I better wrap it up because our time is out unless there's any other last like resource or something you want to share or last no. thought. No, I, I think remember that once we had a conference or some sort of colloquium on the mines. Land mines, yeah. Land mines in Afghanistan. Yeah, we, we did that. Yeah, we can do some of those things and ask some other experts that who have done more work to work on those areas. I have mostly covered the social and political uh, aspects of Afghanistan, the ethnic groups and linguistic and that sort of thing. Uh, there are others that we have done field research on, on, on the mining, cleaning the mines, uh, how difficult it is. Well, thank well, you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Payan, for taking out some time for our podcast. I'm sure our listeners and our viewers really appreciate it. And um, until next time, everyone, look forward okay. to the podcast. Thanks Thank so much. Take care. Uh, when is our director's meeting?